Amen, amen. Welcome, everybody. You made it. You're here. It's warmer in here than it is out there, right? So uh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm excited for, for us to, to just keep going, keep going through the book of James and um, keep showing up on Sundays. And I know John made that joke, you know, John, that was, I think you went too far on that one, John. Yeah, uh, it's not. But um, yeah, but we are glad you're here. We're glad to gather together. We really do value um, gathering in person. And so it's like, if we can, you know, if we can, let's open the doors and meet, right? It's not to make anyone feel guilty who couldn't get out of their driveways. But we do really value gathering. So we do love seeing everybody. We love seeing you in person and, uh, and, and just singing praise and learning from God's word and taking communion together. And uh, we just think that community is kind of the, the lifeblood of, of our church. And so... So today we're, we're back in the book of James. Um, we picked back up, John picked us back up last week in James, and so we started the book of James in the fall, and then we took a little break for Christmas, and now we're continuing on, and we're going to keep going all the way through the book of James leading up to about Easter time, just so you know. Um, and so we're, we're going through this book, and um, we have this question today, and, and John touched on this last week, and, and if you're if you're one of the really attentive people, you, you probably look at Scripture, and you probably look at James 14 through 26, and you, and you might even think to yourself, like, isn't this kind of the same topic, the whole section there? Like, are, are, isn't verse 14 all the way through 26 kind of the same topic? And in, in one sense, we could say, yeah, it, it is. It's the same general idea. I might even make some of the same general points that John made last week, but in another sense, for whatever reason, James decides to kind of reiterate himself over and over here. And there's enough, I think there's enough fodder for us here to, to deal with and to think about that we could spend at least these two weeks on it, and we could probably spend more if we wanted to. And I hope it's fruitful time for you as you just reflect and contemplate on, on this word. And so this whole section in the CSB Bible from 14 all the way down to 26 is all under this, this heading, faith and works. Faith and works. And John talked last week, like, are you a cowboy just because you dress like a cowboy? You know, John's like trying to get to the bottom of what is a real cowboy? And today we're going we're gonna to get to the, the bottom of the question of what is faith? And we're also going to get to the bottom of the question, what is a car? What is a car? So some of you might think like, oh, I, I know what a car is. And I'm like, okay, just don't get too far ahead of yourself here. Maybe you don't know what a car is. Okay, so... There is a contradiction here, it seems, on the surface between James, what, what he's saying, and what Paul says in some other parts of Scripture. So, when we talk about faith and works, sometimes we, we feel like we have, to, we have to deal with this supposed contradiction between what James says and what Paul says. So, we're reading in the book of James, Paul writes all these other letters, though, and in some places, Paul will say things like this. So, this is from Galatians. Paul says, Yet be, because we know a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And then we read in our section today, James chapter 2, verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Paul says, justified by faith in Christ, not by works. James says, justified by works and not by faith. So here we are. Are John and I just trying to pull one over on all of you guys and say, no, nah, these guys, they really agree. Just trust us. Don't worry too much about it. Are we just kind of playing like fast and loose with words here and just kind of tricking you all? Or do they really agree? Are they really in agreement or is there a real contradiction here? We're taking this very seriously. That's why we're spending two weeks in this section here. Are me and John up here preaching, just engaging in, in wordplay and tricking you? Or can these two ideas really be resolved without a contradiction? Well, I think here's what, one thing that happens often when we are misunderstood. Have you ever been misunderstood? Have you ever had somebody misunderstand you? You think about like, okay, you say something and somebody misunderstands. And oftentimes, this is why. 
oftentimes it's because they don't know the context that you were speaking in or you were writing in. They don't understand the context. Like, they don't understand the full picture. They just hear the words or they see what you wrote and they take it out of context. That's a cause of misunderstanding so much of the time. So, uh, you guys know the, the three most important words. We have some real estate people here, I think, in our congregation. You guys know the three most important words in real estate? I bet you guys do, right? What are they? Location, location, location. This is like an old real estate joke. The three most important words in real estate are location, location, location. What's the point? The point is, hey, it's a great house, but it's right by a trash heap. I don't want to live there. It doesn't matter how nice it is on the inside of it. It smells or, or, you know, what's the surrounding? What's around the house? In other words, what's the context that the house is in? What city is it in? What's it near? Is it near any parks? Is it near any schools? What's the context of the house? What about our words? What is the context of our words? That's where we get so much of our meaning. So maybe uh, you remember Drew Marchesani was here several weeks ago. He came over from Cedar Falls and he preached a sermon. And he was in, we were in James still. And he was talking about how James and Paul don't disagree with each other because they're defending the same gospel, but they're facing back-to-back, facing different opponents. That's a way you could think about what James and Paul say and why they don't disagree with each other. Okay, they're, fi- they're defending the same gospel, but they're facing different opponents, people making different kinds of mistakes, different kinds of misunderstandings. Here's a different analogy. If you're a parent, you talk one way to a toddler and you talk a different way to a teenager. At least I'm assuming. I don't have a teenager yet. I do have a toddler, though. And I'm assuming I'm going to have to talk differently to a teenager someday than I do a toddler. That doesn't mean I'm a completely inconsistent parent. That doesn't mean I'm completely irrational. It doesn't mean, even mean I'm really contradicting myself. It means I'm talking to two different kinds of people who have different kinds of problems, who make totally different mistakes. In fact, I might be more crazy if I tried to parent a teenager and a toddler the exact same way, right? And so Paul and James are like parents correcting kids in different phases of their childhood. They're saying different things because the people that they're teaching have different issues or misunderstand different things. And so let's try to understand the context here. And this is what John did last week, and we're kind of reiterating it, but here's specifically what they were doing. James and Paul are are countering two different types of misunderstanding the gospel. James and Paul want everybody to understand the gospel clearly, but they are surrounded by people in their context that have different misunderstandings. Does that make sense? So Paul, Paul is is laying out this theology and he's laying out this gospel, and in a, a lot of the time what Paul is doing is he's inviting new people, he's inviting people to new life in Jesus. And he's saying, you don't have to obey the law enough to earn your way in to salvation. In fact, what he says is, you can't. You can't earn your way in. You can't obey the law enough to earn your way in. It's not your works that save you. That's what Paul is saying. And what he's pointing at is, you're trying to earn it yourself, and that's a sign that you're not trusting God. At the heart of Paul, the, the, the problem Paul is trying to correct is he's telling people, no, you're not trusting God. You're trying to earn it yourself. You're trying to earn your salvation. He's saying, you can't do that. It's, it's by your faith. It's not by the works that you do. It's by your faith. Okay, that's Paul. Now, James, he's talking to different people. James is talking to people who claim to already have their salvation. And he's talking to kind of prideful people who, who are claiming this salvation, but they're not demonstrating any kind of life change based on it. Their life hasn't changed a bit. In fact, they feel no conviction over their sins. They say something like, man, I've, I've professed that Jesus is Savior. I'm good. They say they trust God. Do you see the difference? Paul corrects people that don't trust God, James corrects people that say they trust God. 
And James is like, you're still not trusting God. You say you do, but James is pointing to them, pointing to their works, and he's saying you don't. Faith expressed only in words, only in words, is not faith. So James is correcting people who verbally say they trust God, and yet he says, no, their life doesn't bear that out. Paul discusses the process of becoming a believer, and and this is where we have this doctrine of being saved by faith alone. And this is like a a precious and important doctrine to us in in Christianity, in, in, in the church. Like, you're saved by faith alone. You can't obey the law enough to be saved. We hold this to be precious, and we hold this tightly, and then when we come across what James is saying, it makes us uncomfortable. James says, you're not justified by works. I'm sorry, you're justified by works and not by faith alone. This makes us uncomfortable. And instead of just brush it off, we got to go there and we got to figure out what's going on. So James is inviting us into a challenge. Or maybe he's offering us kind of a litmus test. Like, okay, you say you have faith. Let's test it. Let's see what it would look like. Let's see what faith looks like. Let's have a litmus test for faith. So here's the question we could ask today based on what James is talking about. Is my faith genuine? How would I know? What is faith? That's really the question it comes back to. What is faith? And so you're all dying to know the other question. What is a car? What is a car? You maybe aren't dying to know. You will be in a second. So we're going to ask these two questions. What is faith? What is a car? How can you tell you have real faith? How can you tell it's a real car? You'll see in a minute. Let's read James 2. Like I said, we're going to start in verse 20 here. It's maybe in the middle of a section, but there's plenty to talk about. So we're, we're starting in James 2, verse 20 through 26. Let's read the word and see what James is saying here. James comes right out of the gate here this morning. Senseless person. Sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, he's talking right to me. (laughs) Senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute? Terrible nickname, by the way. Wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers? Wasn't she justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Sorry, my throat's a little dry this morning. It's a little cold out. Okay, so we see four sections in this text today. First, we got a question. In verse 20, then we have Abraham's example, and then we have Rahab's example, and then we have this closing analogy that Paul gives. So we got four sections today. First, let's look at this question. James loves a good rhetorical question. I don't know if you guys have noticed, I do too. I love a good rhetorical question. A question just kind of stirs the audience. So James is kind of like waking them up. First, he's like kind of yells at them, senseless people. And then he gets their attention, he, and he asks this question. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? He doesn't just say, hey, uh, I don't know if you know this, but faith without works is useless. He says, no, are you willing to learn this? James is kind of inviting his readers in, and I think he's inviting me and, and all of us in to learn something that might be challenging. Now, the goal is not to make everyone here feel guilty, but we got to be honest. This might be a challenging question. Are you willing, is the question he asks. 
Are you willing to learn this, church? Let's be invited in and let's be willing. Let's have willing hearts to hear what James is saying today. Because it might challenge us. It might challenge us. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? What if, are, are you willing to ask this question of your faith? That's the thing I was thinking of, like, I'm thinking of this for myself. Am I willing to ask this question of my own faith? Because then I go, wait, what if my faith isn't genuine? What if it's not? Then it's a scary place. Is it? Is it scary? What if it's not genuine? Well, we'll see. There's, there's a solution. There's cause for hope. We'll get there today. But we at least have to be willing to answer this question, to ask this question. Church, without realizing it, we, so we have this important and precious doctrine of being saved by faith alone. Yes, salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Here's what James might be saying. That doctrine, that idea, can become a doctrine of being saved by saying the right words. You can accidentally mistake salvation by faith alone for salvation by having the right answer. Are we saved by having the right answer on the catechism or on the confirmation or, or, or on the Sunday school class? Are we saved by getting the right answer or are we saved by faith that the answer represents? I think that's James' point that he's driving home. Just because you agree with the doctrine doesn't mean you're saved. Agreement with the doctrine doesn't save you. Your, your mental agreement, you're like, okay, I agree with you. He's saying that's not what saves you. Are we willing to learn, church, this morning that our faith must have some traction? It must be real. Imagine this. Okay. I'm in my neighborhood. I've gotten to know my neighbors better this week by plowing snow. For whatever reason, it's like we're just out there and we're just starting to talk to each other more. So I'm starting to get to know my neighbors, right? It's great. The snow, I guess, can be good for a few things. So let's imagine this. I'm out there and I see my neighbor and his garage door is open. And he's got this nice car in there. And I'm trying to be friendly. I'm trying to be, you know, a good neighbor, get to know my neighbors. So I walk over and I stop by to chat. And, I, and it's just a nice sports car sitting there in his garage. And um, I kind of walk around, you know, I'm talking, I'm chatting. I'm like, this is a this is a nice car. This is really cool. Yeah, thanks. You know, I like this car. I've had it for a while. Um, it's black. You know, he's like, yeah, I like a black sports car. It's all polished up. It's shiny. I kind of walk around, you know, I kick the tires. I don't know why people do that, but I'm like, I don't know. It's like, okay, it's not made of cardboard. It must be a real car. It's like holds up when I kick the tires. I guess that means it's a real car. Seems like a real car to me. Why would I have any reason to doubt that it's a real car? So, I chat for a while, go home. Well, that night, here's what happens. My wife goes into labor, and we got to get to the hospital. We got to get to the hospital because this baby is coming. And I go out to our garage, and I go to start our car. Nothing. It's dead. Battery's dead. I'm like, oh, no. What am I going to do? We got to get to the hospital. I'm nervous. I run across the street. Doug, I knock on his door. Doug, man, that car we were looking at earlier, like, I'm in need of a car. Can I borrow your car? He's like, yes, you can borrow it. Go ahead. Keys are in it. So I walk out, and I go, and I get in this car, and I'm like, all right, I have a solution to the problem, right? I have a car to take my wife to the hospital, and I open the door, and I get in, and there's no floorboard. I'm like, okay, that's weird. And there's no pedals. And there's, there's just a little plastic toy key. And there's no ignition. And I'm like, this is really strange. So I get out and I go up to Doug and I'm like, Doug, dude, what, how do I drive this car? He's like, you just put your feet down on the ground and you just kick with your feet. And like you scoot along. He's like, haven't you ever watched the Flintstones? You know, Fred Flintstone moves his car. Like, that's what it is. He's like, I'm like, Doug, this car is useless to me. This car is useless. 
Dubuque is way too hilly. Maybe if it was all downhill, I could kind of make it work, right? But this isn't going to work. I'm like, Doug, that's not a car. I don't care if it looks like one. I don't care if it has the body, four tires, steering wheel, windows, doors. It doesn't have an engine. It's not a car. It looks like a car, but it doesn't do car things. Do you see the point? It doesn't act like a car. I'm like, Doug, your car is useless, man. Is my neighbor willing to learn that a car, no matter how great it looks, without an engine is simply useless? Church, are we willing to learn that our faith without works is useless? A faith that doesn't change our life, that doesn't compel action, is useless. So let's look at Abraham's example. Let's read the text here. Verse 21, start with me there. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? Man, if you thought this was serious, James just stepped it up a notch. Wasn't Abraham justified by works in offering his own son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. He says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Here's the point here. Here's what's going on with this Abraham story. Because it's easy, I think it's easy for us to overthink this whole concept. So I'm going to start trying to maybe bring it down to earth and, and backfill it with a little more hope. It's easy for us to overthink this. Here's the point James is making. So Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That appears in Genesis, I think, chapter 15. It's not until many chapters later that the event happens that James talks about, where he says, uh, Abraham, our father, was justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar. Here's what James is saying. Don't believe that Abraham had faith by anything that he said. Believe that Abraham had faith by what he did. Read the story of Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son on the altar. And the question, we could ask the question, man, why would God do that? Why would God even let it get within seconds of Abraham doing the unthinkable? Thankfully, if you know the story, He doesn't actually have to sacrifice his son. God provides a sacrifice. But it gets really close. So we could ask the question, man, why does God do that? Here's a better question. Do you have any doubt of Abraham's faith? Do you have any doubt how much Abraham trusts God? That he was willing to do that? That is the proof of his faith. That is his faith on display. That's what James is saying. Abraham was justified in his works. We believe in his faith because we saw his willingness to offer his son. That was his faith in action. Don't just believe his words. Believe his actions. Do we, we, we can't read that story and have an ounce of doubt about Abraham's faith. So, we see that In this story, Abraham's faith is on display, and it is very real. So the first point, if you're taking notes today, the first point is this. Faith is not abstract. Sometimes we think faith is this abstract idea. It's this loose concept. We're like, I don't know what it means. It kind of means like believing or something. No, James' point is very clear. That's what faith looks like. It looks like trusting God with your actions. Faith is not abstract. So next, let's look at Rahab's example. Now, this is the one that gives me a little more hope because I'm like, I don't know if I could do what Abraham did. I'm not sure I could do what Abraham did. I don't know if I could be as good as the great patriarch of the Hebrews 
but Rahab the prostitute, maybe I could hang here, you know. I mean, okay, this is, sounds like maybe more of my, the league that I, I could play in, you know. I, I, I'm not going to be as good as Abraham, but I could maybe be at least as good as Rahab the prostitute. So Rahab the prostitute, here, here's, here's the example. It's almost like James gives us the spectrum. He gives us Abraham, who all of his audience would have known, highly revered man in, in their history. And then he just pulls somebody out that's kind of an obscure person from the, from the biblical story. And he's like, from Abraham all the way down to Rahab and every person in between. Here's the story of, of Rahab. What happens is, he says, Rahab the prostitute was justified by works. She was justified by her works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route. So this story takes place in Joshua 2. If you go back and read Joshua 2 sometime this week, you'll see verses 1 through 9, it kind of tells the story of what happens. It's how she welcomes these spies in and they're like, you know, they're trying to check in on the Holy Land and she's friendly to them and she does this even at risk to her, herself, at risk to her own safety based on like the government and the authorities and everything. She puts her life at risk with her actions. Okay, but what's really interesting is then Rahab goes on to make kind of a speech. If you read Joshua 2, verses 9 through 13, she makes this speech, and she like proclaims a bunch of these things. She says, I know that the Lord has given you this land. She says, the Lord your God in heaven above, sorry, the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Those are the words out of Rahab's mouth. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. And James' point is, that's not how we know Rahab had faith. It's not based on what she said. It's based on what she did. It's based on her decision to put herself at risk. That demonstrated her faith, her belief in God. So point two, if you're taking notes. Faith is demonstrated by actions. Faith is demonstrated by actions, not words. Faith is demonstrated by actions, not words. Like I said before, faith is not this abstract concept. It is just a lived out trust in God. Like the car. You guys get the, the point I'm trying to make with the car. It's like, you know what a car is. You guys know what a car is. You get in it, it drives you around. Like, it's not that complicated. You know what a car is. The point is, you know what faith is too. It's not this abstract concept that we don't understand. It's living by trust in God. Any working car, no matter how ugly, as long as it starts and as long as it drives, it can get me and my wife to the hospital. Your faith doesn't have to, you don't have to have this amazing story like Abraham. Your story might be a lot more like Rahab, the prostitute, and you can still have working faith in your life. So, in the closing here, James says in verse 26, just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's like he's hammering this point home. He said, he's almost said the same thing like four times now. Here's what's unique about this time when he says it. He says, you kind of have to pay attention here. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, faith without works is dead. Okay, so we understand the body and the spirit part, like a human body, just the body itself without life like without the spirit, without the living spirit, is dead. Makes sense. But then he compares faith to the body. Sometimes we think faith would be compared to the spirit part, but he compares faith to the body part. He's like, faith? And, and really what this shows is what James is addressing this whole time is like, the spoken word of your faith, the, the spoken, the, the verbal agreement that you have faith is like this hollow shell if it doesn't have works, he's saying it's dead. He's saying that's just, it's just a sign that it's not real. 
If your faith doesn't have works, it's like the body, it's like the human body without life. If faith doesn't have works, it's like the human body without life. What James is getting at is the words of faith without action just don't mean anything. It's like the car without an engine. It's like the human body without life. It's like agreeing with an idea versus acting on an idea. Abraham, Rahab, you, me, all of us. Our faith is not visible by what we say, but by what we do. Like I said, you know what a car is. You know what a car is. What is faith, church? We know this, I think, but, but it's so good for us to tell each other this, for us to remind each other this. Here's my definition of faith for today. Real faith, okay? Real faith is real trust, which leads to real action. Real faith is real trust, which leads to real action. So that's our, we've answered our definition of a car, and now we've answered our definition of what is faith. Real trust, which leads to real action. Okay, still I think we need to inject a little more hope here, because it's like, this can still cause doubts. We can still have doubts here. This is not a hopeless message. I actually think this is a very hope-filled message. Why? Because there's one more part of the contradiction we need to deal with. Paul was saying salvation comes by faith alone, right? Well, not exactly. The way James would hear that sentence would say it would be, well, faith alone, faith in what? It's not just the general abstract idea of faith, right? Return to our question from earlier. How do we know it's faith? It's faith when it's visible through our actions and, and our actions of trust. And the point is, it's not just abstract trust. There's an object of our faith. You guys see, it's not just the idea of faith. It's, just not, it's not just the doctrine. It's not just the concept. It's the object of our faith, which is where all of our hope comes from the whole time. Like the reason there's hope in this whole message is the faith isn't in ourselves. That's why it's good news. Because <laughs> we're all a lot more like Rahab the prostitute than we'd like to admit. We don't have faith in ourselves. We have an object of faith. The doctrine of faith alone as just an idea has no power. Okay, until you meet Jesus. When you meet Jesus, all the hope comes flooding into this message. When you meet Jesus, this message has hope. When you meet Jesus Christ and you put your real faith in him, you cannot help but be changed. I'll say that again. When you meet Jesus Christ and you put real faith in him, you cannot help but be changed. Remember, Faith alone is a shorthand. Like when Paul says faith alone, or when we talk about theology, or we talk about, talk about doctrine, if we ever just say faith alone, it sh we should always realize, like if we're saved by faith alone, it should always be shorthand for faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's faith in no other name, including ourselves, that saves us. But it's faith in Jesus Christ alone. So the culture or, or people of the world might say, you just got to have faith. You just got to have some faith. And I'm like, in what? That's the question. Church, our faith is not just an abstract idea. Our faith is in a person. Our faith is in Jesus. Big idea today is this. I think this is what James is getting at. Real faith in Jesus leads to works. That's the idea. Real faith in Jesus leads to works. Real faith in Jesus. We have hope in this. We are saved in this story, not by ourselves. 
Of course, we know that we're not saved by our works. We tend to get that in the American church. What we need the reminder of is we're not even saved by our words. We're not even saved by just saying, amen. We're not saved by saying I have faith in Jesus, right? It's Jesus that saves us. It's us putting our trust completely on him, not even on ourselves on that little step of saying the words of faith, right? The goal of this church really is not to make you feel bad. It is really not to make you feel guilty. It's to isolate, or it's to clear away any distractions. It's like, stop getting distracted by anything that, that distracts you from Jesus himself. Don't even put your faith in your words or like you having the right doctrines figured out. Put your faith in the person of Jesus Christ. The goal is that we, church, would trust him so much, so fully that our lives would be changed by him. So you don't even have to get to work changing your life. That's the thing. This isn't about, like, our gospel is not behavior modification. Behavior modification will come downstream from putting your trust in Jesus. Transfer your trust entirely to Jesus. And if you do that, church, I dare you not to be changed. If you trust him entirely, I dare you not to be changed. Your application, I'm going long this week, so here's your application. It's simple. Here's your application. If you want to know, what do I do about this message? I think you should pray this prayer this week as much as you can. Here's the prayer. It's four words. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I trust you. Like if this message stirred up doubts in you, here's the good news. This is all you have to pray. Jesus, I trust you. And you receive grace from him. We receive grace from him. Even this morning we're taking communion. Communion is a great reminder. We receive communion. We receive the gift that Christ offers freely. Christ offers his body for us. He offers, he shed his blood for us. It's not our words, it's not our works, it's Christ giving us the gift. So we take communion, we remember that Jesus did that for us. So church, let's take communion together. You, you, during these next two songs, come up either to the front or to the back. We have the tables prepared. There's gluten-free if you need that. And just remember that you didn't set up the tables. You didn't set out the meal. Even if you're one of the volunteers that set out the meal, you don't set out the meal. Jesus sets out this meal for us. All we do is receive. All we do is trust him and receive his grace. Church, I hope we have hope from this message. It can be a challenging message to hear. But man, it can also be so effective in clearing away anything else that we put our faith in outside of Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we do trust you. And we do love you. And Lord, I pray for um, an injection of hope and not doubts to come from a message like this, Lord, but really boldness. Lord, would we be bold and see that, man, though I feel inadequate when I look at what Abraham did out of trust in you, Lord, even me, would I believe that, that I can trust you enough Would we believe, Jesus, that, that, that we can trust you that much? Would we fully transfer our trust in you, holding nothing back? No pride, no selfishness. And see, just in, in the context of this letter, Lord, we see that James has been talking about things like favoritism and things like 
controlling our tongue coming up next week, controlling our speech, would we be able to do things like control our speech or like not show favoritism out of our trust in you and not feel tempted to take matters into our own hands, but just complete surrender, complete trust in you, Jesus, not in our actions and not even in our words. Not in ourselves, but Lord Jesus, would we fully trust in you. We love you. Would you just bring hope, Lord? Would you protect us all um, on the way home today? Lord, I just pray for our city. Would, would everybody be warm and be well-fed in our city? Um, God, just pray for your, your protection. And, and again, for just for us as a church to, to love our neighbors and to serve them, even in practical ways, if there's ways that we can as individual members this week. Um, and would we just be changed by our trust in you, Lord Jesus. We pray all of this in your name, by your spirit. Amen.